Good evening, and welcome to Copernic Observatory. It's great uh, to have a, a full house here, or practically a full house. Uh, my name is Drew Desker. I'm the director here, uh, and um, welcome to our the first of our uh, 2023 Friday night programs. Um, again, typically every Friday night, usually from March to mid-December, uh, we offer a program every Friday night, uh, although in... Um, January and February will typically just open, o offer one program, so tonight's your night. And, um, and next month, um, actually instead of a Friday night, we're going to have a, a Saturday night. It's called a uh, winter, winter Star Party. And um, in fact, actually, if you go here to our website, um, our Winter Star Party, we, we celebrate Copernic's 500, uh, in this case, it would be 550th birthday. Um, again, for those that don't know, uh, Copernic Observatory is named after Mi the Polish astronomer Mikolaj Copernic, and um, but we know him as Nicholas Copernicus. Okay, real quick pop quiz here: What was Copernicus famous for? Right. He developed what's called the heliocentric model of our solar system. Up until Copernicus' time, people thought that the sun and all the planets revolved around the Earth, but sometimes those planets looked like they'd be moving backwards and. We call that retrograde motion, and that bugged Copernic. So he did the math and said, no, if you put the sun in the center, then it all makes sense. So in um, 1973, Copernic would have been 500 years old. And a group of Polish immigrants, people of Polish heritage here in the southern tier, wanted to commemorate that 500th anniversary. And rather than buy a statue, plunk it in the park, they said, no, let's do something. So they built the original observatory which actually you can see the, one of the original buildings is that brick wall right there. Uh, and then two of our domes uh, were part of the original building. It was then donated to Robertson. Uh, they ran it for about 33, 34 years. In the 1990s, they expanded it to where we are today. But in uh, 2007, uh, Robertson decided to focus on what they were doing downtown. And so it actually came back to the Polish uh, community. So the Copernic Society of Broome County is who uh, owns and operates the Copernic Observatory. We are a nonprofit. Uh, we do not get any government uh, funding. Uh, we don't belong, you know, we're not connected to any university per se. So our programs are, um, and our memberships are what really fund us. Um, now, just as a matter of, I see a lot of new faces here, but uh, uh, who's here for the first time? All right, a good number of people. Great. Okay. Who here are members? All right, not as many, but uh, those people that put their hands up second know something important, and that's uh, the value of, of a Copernic membership. We, uh, a Copernic membership gets you into Copernic any Friday night, um, and also a number of other special events. We might do some uh, special observing events. But we belong to an uh, organization called the Association of Science and Technology Centers. It's a, a consortium of over 350 other science centers that will honor the Copernic membership. So you could go to the Robertson Museum. You could go to the Ithaca Science Center. You could go to the Franklin Institute down in Philly or the Intrepid Museum down in New York City. The 350 other uh, science centers. And our, our family membership is actually $75. is pretty uh, inexpensive when you compare it to what you might do if you were going to, say, uh, be a member of the um, uh, Franklin Institute. Um, so if you like this kind of place, a, a Copernic membership is actually a, a pretty decent, uh, uh, pretty decent deal. We uh, again, we do Friday night programs. We do a lot of school outreach. We have a portable planetarium that we can take out to places. Um, we have a fairly extensive summer camp program, and we do a lot of school programs as well. So uh, we're really all about teaching and uh, uh, really the the whole uh, the whole age range. We have a, a group. Uh, we have a program here called Caperna Kids for kids as young as three years old. And through programs like this, which we, uh, is more aimed at sort of lifelong learning. And um, we have a, a program called uh, Girl Power Science. And it's a program where we're really trying to get more women into STEM careers. And so we always uh, will have girls from third grade through eighth grade come up and, and, uh, and spend a day or two up here learning about some aspect of science or technology. And we always have a female subject matter expert talk about the work that, they, that she does. And a few years ago, we had a, a, an astrophysicist from NASA talk about the work she does using satellites to 
look at carbon dioxide levels and have that is how, how does that relate to the global warming that we you know that we're experiencing and then because it's a video conference then our girls get to ask the her questions and one of the girls asked how did you get interested in astrophysics and her answer was great she said when I was in college I was an English major but my boyfriend was a physics major we would go from observatory to observatory I eventually dumped the boyfriend but I kept the astronomy she now has her PhD in astrophysics and works for NASA. So you never know where a seed is going to get planted. So um, there's a lot of fertile ground here, and it's not just in the um, non-gray hair uh, area here. Uh, it's really an opportunity to, to learn how the world works. And, um, and our Friday night programs are really what, what that's really all about. Um, I don't want to steal some of what uh, uh, Jeremy's going to talk about because... Uh, Jeremy, uh, Jeremy Cardi, our presenter today, is also our live stream astronomer, and he'll, uh, he'll I'm sure, will be talking about some of the work that he does with that. Uh, the other thing I also mentioned is that, uh, again, we, like, we try to be a good uh, community uh, uh, partner, and so we are actually partnering with the American Red Cross. So on Friday, se uh, February 17th, we are doing a, blood cro a Red Cross blood drive. This is actually our seventh blood drive here from 1 to 6. Um, so if you're in a position to, to, uh, to help out, um, we, what we always do also is that um, uh, for those people that come up and donate, um, it, because it's during the day, if the sun is out, we put a solar filter on one of our telescopes and you can actually look at the sun safely, as long as it's not cloudy. So hopefully, um, I know some of you already got a chance to, to look through um, one of our scopes at the moon. Hopefully uh, by the end of the program, we'll still have a little bit of moon left to, to see, so we invite you to, to go out and do that. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn... Uh, Turn the program over now to, uh, to Jeremy. We um, are very, very fortunate to have Jeremy. He started out actually as a high school intern and um, has really uh, blossomed. I'd like to say we had a, a little bit of an effect on his, uh, his career trajectory. So, uh, Jeremy, it's up to you. And have you, uh, are you mic'd up? I am, yep. Oh, Sounds like it's right. working. Yep. I'll step away. <laughs> All right, thank you, Drew. And uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jeremy. I am a science educator here at Copernic. I'm also Copernic's live stream astronomer. If anyone's visited our YouTube channel, you may have seen us uh, talking about a variety of astronomical events. And uh, that's actually where I'd like to start, just to show that uh, you know uh, tonight's topic is winter skies. What can we see this time of year? Um, and a great way to uh, observe with us, especially on uh, the Friday nights that are cloudy, <laughs> uh, and where we branch outside of that so you can at least see what our telescopes are seeing virtually for the, the big events. So uh, this is our YouTube channel, Copernic Observatory. Um, over the last year, we really uh, grew in our subscriber base. Uh, we, during the lunar eclipse back in May of 2022, we added something like 8,000 subscribers. It really blew up. Uh, and uh, we're so happy to have a, an amazing audience on uh, the live streams and in person with you. So uh, they're watching right now. In fact, if I refresh this page, you will see that Winter Skies is streaming now. Uh, we have uh, a new camera right at the near the projector, if you can see it. So hello, everyone, <laughs> on the YouTube stream. Um, and uh, they're able to watch what we do. They're watching, they'll watch the presentation along with us. And we'll take questions from both you in the audience and in the live chat. <laughs> All right. Uh, so. I mentioned we, we covered the May lunar eclipse, and that was a big one for us. Another big one last year was the second lunar eclipse that happened in November. Uh, May was a lot nicer to observe. Um, it was more of an evening into uh, early morning event, um, whereas the November one was just all early morning. You had to get up nice and early to watch that one. Uh, but you can scrub through all of our videos that we've posted. Uh, so this is actually a time lapse of the lunar eclipse, and let's see if we'll, we will get an ad. So I'm just going to scroll down a bit here and mute this, <laughs> and then we'll, we'll watch the November lunar eclipse time lapse. <laughs> we always post a time lapse for the at least events that are relevant for it. Um, so that instead of watching the entire live stream that is usually a few hours long or more, uh, we end up with, here, let's get this, there we go. Unmute. Uh, the lunar eclipse in a minute. 
So here's the November eclipse in. It actually just a bit less than a minute. We didn't get to see the entire thing, unlike the May eclipse. The, the moon set before it was finished. Uh, but a lunar eclipse is when the moon passes into the Earth's shadow. So that's what you're starting to see here. It's very different from lunar phases, which is just how the moon orbits around the Earth. You're looking at it from different perspectives. This is all happening in a few hours. And as it darkens, it takes on what you may have heard as the blood moon or the red moon. You get this red color. We even get some more detail out of it in a moment here. And you get the stars in the background as well because the moon's nice and dark. Those pop out at you too. You may have noticed a bit of uh, blue sky there uh, as well. What was kind of neat about this event for us, even though we didn't get to see it all, we did get to observe a lunar eclipse in, in twilight, which is kind of neat. It's not, it wasn't a dark sky as the moon was setting uh, because the moon will be on the opposite side of the Earth from the sun during a lunar eclipse, just like a full moon. So that means as the moon sets, the sun is rising, and that's why it's in, in twilight. So a uh, nice little example of what we are able to do. Um, I'll mention another live stream that we attempted back in December and unfortunately the clouds got to us then. But uh, yeah, the whole resource for you, I mean, you look at, you click videos, you can just keep scrolling down this page. They'll keep loading. <laughs> we've done so much over the past few years, so uh, we welcome you to check those out. Uh, but now let's move on to our topic for tonight, which is winter skies. I'll get my slideshow loading here. Maybe. There it goes. All right, so winter skies. <clears throat> and things we're going to talk about tonight include the ABCs of stargazing. A couple, of, if you've seen our sky programs in the past, um, some of these will be familiar to you. Um, we're going to run through just an, a quick overview for those that aren't quite familiar with how to uh, observe objects in the night sky, how to find them, how to measure the objects in terms of brightness. Um, that's what the ABC of, of stargazing is for. So I'm sorry if it's repetitive for some, but I think it's really important to cover it each time uh, for any newcomers to astronomy. And then uh, we're going to take a look at what can we see in the sky this winter. And uh, we'll cover the ISS or the International Space Station. We're going to go into solar system objects and deep sky objects. And then finally, I'll, we'll wrap up with some observing tools that you can use at home. Uh, or if you're ever in a nice dark sky site like Copernic, uh, or the Adirondack Mountains, or Cherry Springs State Park, those are all great places to go observing. Um, you can bring those tools along with you, and they'll come in, in handy. All right. So first, getting into the ABCs of stargazing. A. A is for angular size and distance. This is how you, and you have a great tool at, with you at all times to measure angular size and distance. Now when I say angular size and distance, all I'm referring to is measuring something in terms of an angle, in terms of degrees. Uh, so how many degrees in a circle? 360, 360 yep. So that's what we're, we're measuring. We're measuring the angular uh, distance here. So it's showing you on this graphic that you can just use your hand to measure objects in the sky in degrees. Now the trick to this is that your arm has to be stretched right out. Okay, And we'll start with the, the, the pinky here. And that one measures one degree. The width of your pinky is about one degree. This is approximate, right? Because you know our arms are different sizes, our hands are different sizes, but it works rel okay uh, in general from person to person. You're just trying to get an estimate, and what's great is once you have this c way to communicate where objects are in the sky, uh, you have a way to help other people find them. All right, and uh, next up we have three fingers, arms stretched out here, and that's about five degrees. Okay. 
And you have a uh, fist, which is 10 degrees. Again, that's across. And then uh, finally, you put your index finger and your pinky finger out, and that's 15 degrees. And uh, you know, if you're trying to figure out where something is across the sky, maybe from the horizon, maybe there's something like 45 degrees up, you can just rotate just like this to count up how far that star is in the sky. So right, you go 15, 30, 45, and there you go. Uh, you have your angular measurement, measurement for the object you're looking at. And again, a way to communicate that to someone. So this will come in, uh, well, we'll see a coordinate system that uses degrees uh, in the C part of our ABCs. So we'll see that in a moment. But first, we're going to go to B, which is for brightness. Uh, and in astronomy, we call this magnitude. Now, uh, the way we uh, represent magnitude in astronomy is a little counterintuitive. Um, but just bear with me here. This is our brightness scale. You'll see over here negative numbers are very bright. So the sun is out here near minus 30. Very bright on the negative side of the scale. And as you go further to the right, dropping down in neg the negative number values, here's the moon at about uh, negative uh, 13 or so. Then you go down to about negative 4 where Venus lives. Here's the star Sirius, which we'll talk about later. About negative uh, 2. And then you cross the zero point, which would be the star Vega. Another bright star. We haven't quite gone, gotten to the point where you can't see things. That's right here at around uh, six or seven in magnitude, depends on how good your eyes are. Um, and that's the faintest naked eye star that you can see, meaning unaided, no telescope, just your eyes looking up at the sky. Uh, then you go out to the really dim stuff um, that you definitely need an instrument to see. So beyond this point, uh, a tool is required ideally a telescope. Uh, binoculars would help too. Anything that helps uh, magnify the object to your, to your eye. All right, uh, so again, a little uh, counterintuitive to how we think about things, but again, just remember negative numbers are bright, positive numbers are where you get dimmer. And I really want to point out again, this plus five point, five to six to seven is where things start to become difficult to see with your eye. We'll come back to that later. All right, then I mentioned before C. C is for coordinates. And there are a couple of different coordinate systems we can use in astronomy. Um, so when we're talking about how things look from where you are with respect to you and how you're observing things on the ground on Earth, we have an al altitude and azimuth system. So you can see we have a couple of people looking at a star in the sky here, and they're able to measure um, using altitude, which is exactly what it sounds like. You're measuring degrees as you go up. So 90 degrees is up here. You come down, and zero degrees is your horizon. OK, and 90, 90 degrees, we call that the zenith. OK, and then here you'll see the azimuth, which is the circle around you. Um, that we measure at north is 0 degrees, south is 180 degrees. As you come back around, you, count, you can count that full circle all the way up to 360. OK. So uh, the other coordinate system is called equatorial, an equatorial co coordinates. And that's with respect to the Earth's rotation. So whereas with al altitude and azimuth, the stars will move through those coordinates. So if you saw a star, remember at that 45 degree mark we talked about earlier, we saw a star there at one point in time. If we kept looking in that spot, the star is going to move from that coordinate. 
And that's because of the Earth's rotation, right? That's what drives day and night, the stars moving across the sky as well as the planets day to day. So that's out as it won't stay with the stars. Your coordinate won't stay stuck to that star there. Whereas with equatorial, it does. And that's really handy when it comes to, for example, our telescopes out in uh, the observatory. Uh, each one of those dome telescopes is on an equatorial mount uh, that is designed to track those objects in the sky as the Earth rotates. So it's using the equatorial system so we can keep up with that motion of the Earth. And again, the coordinate of your star Vega is always going to be those coordinates with this system. All right, so two different ways to map out the sky. OK, now uh, I want to show you Stellarium next, because we'll be coming back to Stellarium throughout the program. And I just want to uh, give you a look at it, where you can download it, and uh, just so you know what we'll be using as a tool to help us figure out where these objects are in the sky. So this is the website you can visit uh, to download Stellarium or view the web-based version. Uh, and it's uh, available for all the platforms you can think of, Mac, Windows, Linux. Um, and then there's a web version if you have a Chromebook at home. It, the web version does work on mobile devices, but there is an app uh, that you can download for free on both Android and iOS. So Stellarium, Stellar and then EM. And uh, that EM is coming from the fact that this is your at-home planetarium. You can use this and operate it just as maybe you've seen uh, we, for example, Copernic has a portable planetarium that we bring around uh, to schools and libraries. Basically, anyone who asks us, we, we like to bring our dome as long as we can fit it. And uh, that's our, our planetarium. Roberson has a planetarium as well. Uh, but this is one that you can operate at home. So let's just jump to the web version quick. Just I want to show you that, what it looks like. It's all the way to the right here. And again, as long as you have an internet, internet connection, this will work for you. And if you've been in a planetarium, you know that it's uh, sort of like a theater, but it's dome-shaped above your head to simulate the sky. And we don't have a dome-shaped screen on our computers, right? We have a flat screen, a rectangular screen to work with. So instead of looking around, you can just pan with your mouse to look around the sky. <clears throat> now, uh, actually, yeah, I'll, I'll hold off on that. Um, for what you can do on smartphones, we'll talk about later um, another way to navigate the sky. But uh, this is a, a very handy tool. Let's go into the application, though, the downloadable version. The web app is a little simple with the downloadable version of Stellarium, you have all, all kinds of options to work with. All right. So here is Stellarium. And you can see we have our constellation artwork on now. I, can, I have full control over my planetarium. So I can turn the, the artwork off so I can see more stars. I can even turn the lines off. Or if I want to see what those constellations are called, I can turn on the labels. Uh, it looks like the atmosphere is turned off right now, um, which is not something you can do in real life. Um, so <laughs> that's something you can see when I turn the atmosphere back on, we get that sky glow again. Uh, so sort of simulating some light pollution um, and just the nature of our atmosphere that prevents us from really looking out deep into space from the, the surface of the Earth. It's OK, but we like our oxygen, though, right? We need it. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll play around with some of the tool set as we go through, but I wanted to give you an initial look. Again, same idea. You can just pan around the sky in different compass directions. You can look right up towards zenith at that 90 degrees. You can even get this really crazy view where you're looking down at the Earth at 0 degrees. So. It's a full 360 look at the sky. All right, 
Let's jump back in here. And carry on. So what can we see in the sky? Well, if we could blow the clouds away, a lot. But I'm going to at least show you some nice images of objects that are out there. Um, and hopefully if we get some clear skies coming up, we'll have a chance to see them. All right, so first is the International Space Station. You can see the ISS with just your eye. So this is where the astronauts live, where they have lived for a few decades now. Um, after the Apollo era, uh, we started to uh, pull back and focus on low Earth orbit exploration for human space exploration. Of course, NASA and other space agencies have launched numerous missions beyond the Earth uh, to Mars, to Pluto, deep into our solar system. But uh, for the last uh, almost 50 years, uh, humans have been restricted to low Earth orbit. And the ISS was a, a big push for that. Um, and this structure, to give you a sense of how big it is, we do have a model out in the lobby, um, not a full scale model. <laughs> this thing is uh, potentially bigger than Copernic. <laughs> so this thing is the size of a football field. <coughs> and yeah, they, they live in these modules inside. You can see there's huge solar panels, and that accounts for a good portion of the size of the structure. Uh, but the modules that the people live in are right in the center here. And this is orbiting about 250 miles above our planet. So that's what is considered low Earth orbit. Um, and it orbits once every 90 minutes. This thing is just booking it around the Earth. Uh, and that means there's tons of opportunities to observe it. So here's the speed it's going, 17,500 miles per hour. OK, that's a big number. Have, we, have any of you gone that fast? <laughs> um, so uh, let me give you some perspective on that. So at that speed, you could travel from New York City to Los Angeles in nine minutes. That's a quick flight, right? So r really speedy spacecraft. And again, that means that we get a lot of chances to observe it. All right, so there's a great way to track these ISS fly flyovers. In fact, there's many different platforms that you can use to, uh, to locate the ISS. We're going to use this one called heavensabove.com. Now, this is the flyover that's happening right about now, <laughs> um, actually a, little, a few minutes from now. Um, unfortunately, with the clouds, probably not worth going out there to find it, especially given, if you look, if, especially those in the front of the room, you'll see this little uh, line there. It's not a full flyover. It's too uh, late in the evening. Um, the sunlight won't reflect off the, the ISS um, for very long. So it goes into shadow pretty quick. But I do have the web page open for Heavens Above. In fact, right to, let me show you what it looks like on the home page first. When you go to heavensabove.com, you get a list of different satellites that are in orbit around the Earth. And we're going to click on ISS. And they'll give you an up-to-date view of flyovers that are happening. So you can see January 27th, right? Here was a flyover right about at 6 o'clock. This is 24-hour time. So this says 1757, which is uh, almost 1,800 hours, which translates to 6 p.m. This brightness here, negative 1.6. That's, that's bright, right? Based on our, uh, our magnitude uh, graph we saw earlier, negative 1.6 is pretty bright. Um, almost approaching the brightness of Jupiter, and uh, we said Venus was a negative 4. So it's, it's a pretty bright. And even down here, look at how it changes. Down to this one, it is as bright as Venus at a negative 3.9. So it will change its brightness uh, based on its perspective to us here on Earth and how the sunlight is reflecting primarily off those solar panels, the huge part of the ISS. So we have a, we're in a nice period where we get to see a lot of flyovers happen at convenient times. That's important too, right? We don't have to stay up all night to see the ISS. 
Uh, and like I said, there's, there is one happening at 734, but it's a very brief flyover. It doesn't get very high. So here's your highest point column. And that one is a 13 degree uh, altitude. That's as high as it gets. And it only goes from 734 to 735. <laughs> so that's a very quick one. Um, if you get a full arc across the sky of the ISS where it's visible, it can be uh, several minutes of uh, observing the ISS. And of course, the fun part when you observe is the fact that you know that there's humans aboard. Who's on the ISS, I wonder? Let's find out. Who is on board the ISS? Well, there they are, the crew of Expedition 68. And if you get the chance to see the ISS in the next uh, few, uh, couple weeks, then, well, I, I think they'll be there for, for a while. I don't know the exact date where they come back home. But this is the crew you'll, you'll know is aboard. <coughs> so I'll, I'll run down the names. Apologies if I don't get them, them all right. <laughs> but uh, this, on the left is NASA astronaut Frank Rubio. Second here is Roscosmos astronaut Dimitri Petalin. Uh, then we have uh, JAXA, that's the Japanese Space Agency astronaut Koichi Wakata. Uh, then again, NASA astronaut in the middle, Josh, Josh Caseda. NASA astronaut Nicole Mann. Roscosmos Russian astronaut Sergei Pro Pro Prokopiev. Sasha knows how to pronounce these. <laughs> Um, and then, uh, lastly, again, a Roscosmos astronaut, Anna Kikina. So, uh, seven astronauts aboard. Now, the ISS is currently in a little bit of trouble because the Soyuz uh, capsule that usually returns crew back to the Earth has a huge leak in it. And you may have seen that in the news. <laughs> As of right now, there's not a great way, a safe way, to get all astronauts back to the Earth on the ISS, as it's set up and currently configured. But uh, it's uh, crises like these where you do get countries coming together, especially given the state of uh, Russia and the United States. Um, and they are collaborating on a way to get uh, both the two, it was, I believe it's two Roscosmos astronauts and one NASA astronaut. They're the ones that would have flown back on that Soyuz. So they're working on a way to get them back. Uh, they'll most likely launch another Soyuz capsule up there and replace the one that is leaking. In case you're wondering, how did the leak start? A micrometeoroid. That's the danger of space travel. Um, a tiny little piece of space debris, um, most likely a natural uh, chunk of, of meteor. Uh, flew in to the Soyuz capsule at very high speed and it doesn't take much. It can just be little tiny grains and just moving at a high enough speed they will puncture spacecraft. So that's what caused the leak and they're working on it right now to, to figure out the next steps and they should have a solution in February into March. All right, but, <laughs> um, so all right, so that's the ISS. By the way, I didn't mention what it looks like. When you observe the ISS in the sky, it looks like a very bright moving star. There's not going to be any tail attached. Uh, in general, satellites will just look exactly like moving stars in the sky. So uh, that's what you'll want to look for. No blinking lights. What do blinking lights mean? Airplanes, yep. OK, now moving into the solar system. What can we see? in the sky for things that are closer to home. Still pretty far away. But as for planets and uh, our moon, this is, this is the list that we can see, the objects that are nice and bright. Uh, so we have Venus. Venus is the second planet from the sun. Turns out it's the hottest planet in the solar system, even though Mercury is closer. And that's because it has a very thick atmosphere. Uh, with a lot of clouds that trap all of that sunlight that hits it. So a runaway greenhouse effect on Venus uh, and uh, sort of the Earth's, uh, I hesitate to say evil, it's not quite that personified, 
But you know, it's uh, you wouldn't want to live there. <laughs> but it's about the same size as the Earth, so kind of like an evil twin. Um, but then we have uh, Jupiter. Jupiter follows Venus as these objects set in the sky. Venus sets first because it's so close to the sun. It never gets very far away from the sun. Same with Mercury. Mercury is even harder to observe. So uh, Jupiter, though, can drift pretty far away. And that, that's how it was a few months ago. We had a lot of time to observe Jupiter. But now we've moved enough in our orbit that eventually Jupiter will drift behind the sun for a bit. So by the way, these were all taken at Copernic, these images here. That's why they might look a little bit fuzzy compared to what you've, you've seen on the web. Um, but I think they're still pretty nice all the same. Taken with our telescopes, this one of Jupiter, do you see this little dark spot? That dark spot is a shadow from one of the moons of Jupiter. I believe it was Io. It's been a couple years since this picture was taken. But if you look carefully, you'll see this other little spot. That is the moon. And that's the moon's shadow on Jupiter. And then here, this red spot. That is the great red spot, a huge hurricane system bigger than the Earth on Jupiter. So uh, we've ever since Galileo first observed Jupiter, he noticed this great red spot. So we, it, it's been going on for at least a few hundred years at this point. Probably even longer than that, though. Uh, but that was the first time we were able to observe it was with Galileo's telescope. Then down here we have the moon. Now, throughout the winter, you'll have plenty of opportunities to observe the moon. Uh, it goes through its phases once a month, a little less than a month. So uh, plenty of opportunities to see it from those different phases. Uh, and we'll check out in Solarium uh, how that changes and how it moves across the sky from day to day. And then finally, we have Mars. And this is the red planet, fourth planet from the sun. And that red color comes from the, uh, the natural rust across its entire surface. Uh, it has iron oxide. But what's neat is that it's just a tiny layer of rust. You dig a little bit into the surface of Mars, and that red color starts to go away. So it's very superficial. But because it's all across the surface, Mars is noticeably red in the sky, sort of an orange, uh, orangey color. Uh, then down here, you'll also notice one of the polar ice caps of Mars. Uh, so that white spot there. Uh, Mars has two ice caps, much like uh, the Earth, uh, but not composed of water. There is some water there, but mostly composed of carbon dioxide or dry ice, which we will see later, too. If you heard that loud noise in the lobby, that's what that was. <laughs> um, so uh, Mars is about half the size of the Earth. And because it's so small, the best time to observe it is when it's close, at opposition, on a close approach to the Earth. And uh, this just recently happened uh, back in uh, December. I think it was December 7th or 8th. And that was the best time the most ideal time to observe Mars, but it's still pretty close right now and pretty bright in the sky. It'll be a little bit yet before it really drifts away to a point where it's uh, just going to look like a blob in a telescope. Right now, if you looked at it through our scopes, you would see some detail on its surface. So uh, still some time to observe uh, Mars in its prime. OK, so solar system. Now, what's neat is. There's a couple of conjunctions related to these four objects we just talked about. Now, a conjunction is when uh, you have these objects get pretty close to each other in the sky. Now, in 3D space, they are not close at all, right? Um, the moon is much f closer to us than Mars or Jupiter or Venus. That's why it appears larger in the sky, even though it's smaller than those objects. So that's something to keep in mind with this. They're not really close to each other. It's just they're apparently close, meaning from our perspective, looking out, they get close to each other in the sky. So on January 30th, there's a Moon and Mars conjunction. And there was a Moon-Mars conjunction back in uh, December, right around the same time as opposition. And we really wanted to stream that. And we did try, but uh, uh, it didn't pan out. Again, the clouds misbehaved. <laughs> so 
the uh, cool part about that conjunction was that it was an occultation as well, meaning Mars passed behind the moon and then it emerged. Um, so you almost got a Mars set and a Mars rise um, as you were looking at it through a telescope. And there are some great videos uh, out there of people recording that event. I definitely think it's worth checking out. Um, there might be an occultation for this one uh, at some locations on the Earth on January 30th, not ours. But that's kind of cool, right? The fact that you can be at a different location on the Earth. And this is an example of 3D space, where you actually get a sense of not this 2D picture in the sky that we usually experience, but uh, these objects actually being represented in 3D. So that means when you move across the surface of the Earth, you might get an occultation where the Mars will drift behind the moon because you've changed your perspective enough. Uh, but uh, that won't happen for us in this case. We'll, we'll miss out on that occultation. But they will get close enough that you'll see them in the same telescope at the same time, which is really neat. So, uh, or binoculars too. Then February 22nd, we have a moon, a crescent moon, and uh, Jupiter conjunction. Uh, they don't get quite as close as Mars and the moon, but uh, they're still, uh, again, with binoculars, it should be wide, uh, with a wide enough field, you'll be able to see that conjunction play out. Um, and also, just it's convenient too. If you want to observe the moon, Jupiter is also right nearby, so you can bounce between the two of them. And then finally, on March 1st, you have uh, Venus and Jupiter. Uh, Venus-Jupiter conjunction. We'll see just how close those get in Stellarium. There we go. So let's go find them. So we're going to jump into Stellarium and learn how to find the planets now. So first, let's get to make sure we're at current time. When this hourglass shape is highlighted down in the lower right toolbar, that means that you are at current time. All right, so January 27th. This looks like it's an hour behind for some reason. Um, but anyways, close enough. <laughs> uh, and we can see that some of the planets and the moon, and there's, there's Jupiter, right? They're out. If we back up, you'll see this is at 4 o'clock, 4.43 p.m. in the afternoon. Just as the sun's setting, you can also notice, I didn't put this one in our presentation here, Saturn is out technically, just before or just after sunset. You're not going to have too much luck finding it though. It, Saturn's further away when it's nice and dark outside and Saturn's out. It's pretty bright, but in twilight like that, it's going to be a real challenge to, to find it. Whereas Venus, as we said, is nice and bright. It will break through the twilight. Um, and you'll see it as a nice bread evening star. Of course, not a real star, it's a planet, but you, it's been known uh, to be called that. So uh, Venus is out. Let's see what Venus looks like when we zoom in. We can press the space bar to center and start tracking the object, and we can use the scroll wheel to zoom in. And there's a simulated view of Venus. Again, not much to see on the surface. That's the same with a telescope. You'll just be seeing a bright white dot, more or less, in the sky with a scope. That's uh, because those clouds are very reflective as well. But what is neat about Venus, and what I, in the picture I showed you earlier, is that you go through phases. So that's what's neat to observe about Venus. You can see this is more of a gibbous Venus. A gibbous would be more of an oval shape, right? Not a full Venus like we would have a full moon. It's more of a gibbous, like a gibbous moon. Um, and we do occasionally get the crescent view, which is in that picture. You'll get the crescent Venus, which is just a sharp line. It's very bright. It's still very bright in the sky, but uh, it would just be the sharp line in a telescope. OK, zoom out from Venus. And we'll advance time a bit here. Now, as the winter goes on, Venus will get higher in the sky, and you'll have more time to observe it um, after sunset. 
Right now, it's still pretty close to the horizon there. But like I said, you'll have some more time. It's pretty right at 545 there. It's right on top of the horizon. OK, well, well the, of the ones that are out still, we have Jupiter, the moon, and Mars. And again, this is the sky as it is tonight. So let's take a look at Jupiter. Zoom on in. So there's Jupiter. And you can get pretty close and see some nice detail. Ah, yes, good observation. We have the great red spot there, as we saw in the picture. And if we zoom out a little, you'll also see some of the moons of Jupiter. <coughs> These here are the Galilean moons. There's four Galilean moons, again, named after the astronomer Galileo Galilei, who first observed them. And they are Ganymede, Io, Europa, and Callisto. In fact, the largest moon in the solar system is this one right here. It's Ganymede. Each of these moons are very interesting in their, their own right. Europa, for example, has a subsurface ocean, liquid water ocean, um, right underneath its icy crust. Um, and uh, it's, it, actually, let's see if it, it's rendered nicely in here. We can zoom in on Europa. Yeah, that, that's pretty. Eh. I wish we could get a little closer. But you can see just about that there's some cracks in the surface of Europa, like its crust is breaking apart. And water flows up and freezes back over. It's very dynamic. Io is also interesting. See all those little specks on Io? I'm not sure why it's dancing like that. It doesn't really do that. Um, but those little specks, each of one of those is a volcano. Io is incredibly volcanic, over 400 volcanoes on that moon. All right, there's Jupiter. Then we have the moon. What phase are we in tonight? <clears throat> All right, nearly, nearly a half moon. Uh, this is a approaching first quarter. Now, first quarter meaning the first quarter in the, the lunar cycle. And so we're on our way to a full moon, which we call waxing. And finally, we have Mars. And look at where Mars is. This is tricky because we'll get into a little bit more about stars in a bit. But do you see this constellation Taurus? What does Taurus look like? Uh, Taurus is a bull. OK, so you have the, the horns of Taurus out here. The body comes out this way. And you'll notice this star right here, Aldebaran, or Aldebaran, um, it's a very reddish star. Look where Mars is, right nearby. So that can help you or hinder you, depending on if you know how to find Taurus. Um, they're similar in color. One way that usually works when you're trying to determine what's a planet and what's a star, stars will generally twinkle. They'll have a twinkle effect as the star's light uh, travels all this way and passes through our atmosphere. Whereas planets are going to be a nice steady light, uh, a bright torch in the sky. Okay, So planets won't twinkle. All right, so oh, let's zoom in on Mars while we're here. There's Mars. And Mars does have moons. Two moons, Phobos and Deimos. Phobos is closest. Um, and they're very, they're very tiny. They're little captured asteroids, most likely. And, uh, uh, but it, Mars can say it has one more moon than us, all the same. OK, so those are the objects out in the sky and as they are tonight. Uh, I would like, let's turn off the labels here, the constellations. We'll leave the lines up. And I just want to click through the days and show you how the planets may move and how the moon especially. We'll zoom out even a bit here. So here's our western sky. Here's our eastern sky. The planets, the sun, the moon will appear to rise in the east and set in the west. 
But planet translates to wandering star. And from week to week, month to month, the planets will change their position against the stellar background. So let's see if we can see that here. First, you'll see the moon trekking across the sky as we go day by day. So we're already February 5th now. We're going, clicking a you know, day ahead, keeping the same time. And now if we go, let's go month to month now. Let's watch what Mars does. Let's zoom in a bit. Oops. Come on. There we go. Well, keep Taurus in mind, right? It's just above the horn of Taurus, February 6th here. But here's March 6th. See how it went in between the horns of Taurus. It's n the stars stay the same with respect to each other. They keep their position in the sky. They don't drift away from each other or anything. But the planets will wander. I don't know if it is. Let's see. Uh, it's moving. It's moving. Yeah, it's moving eastward. Yep. Moving roughly eastward across or through Taurus. Um, let's zoom out here. So all the planets will move through the stars, like you see there. The moon does it even quicker. It's all these objects that are in orbit, and of course we account for this motion too. Um, not just our rotation, but our orbit around the sun. Uh, okay, so that is the planets. Now, let's go back here, because I'm sure there are some of you that have uh, a question already about a solar system object that's been in the news. And that's this one. <laughs> Comet C 2022 E3 ZTF. That's uh, quite a mouthful, isn't it? Well, what does all that mean? It means something, right? I mean, we can pull, pro probably guess. Okay, 2022, that's last year. Maybe that makes you think discovery date. Um, so that's true. It was discovered in 2022. But here, I'll, I'll give you an idea. So the C, when we're cataloging, co cataloging comets, the C means it's non-periodic. It has an orbit that's greater than 200 years around the sun. In fact, this one is measured to be about 50,000 years. It's a long, long orbit. <clears throat> now this, as I said, is the year of discovery. The E3 means it's the third comet, third comet discovered in the fifth half month. Okay, so we got two half months in January, two half months in February, two half months in March, but this was discovered in the first half month of March. Okay, so that's the E3, and then finally we have ZTF, which is, stands for Zwicky Transient Facility, where the comet was discovered. So whenever you see something in parentheses, that's basically who discovered it back in 2020 when we were observing uh, Comet Neowise. Uh, that was uh, the discovery there. So uh, ZTF just doesn't have as much of a ring to it. So I think more often now you've been hearing it referred to as the Green Comet, and that is certainly accurate. Uh, we'll see some pictures of it here in a moment. Uh, so, I mean, you've seen this name in the news, so I just wanted to try and do my best to explain what each of those parts were. Um, they have a meaning, it's just this one it's, tr it's troublesome to come up with a good name for this comet. <laughs> okay, but I've got one more here. What's a comet? Uh, there are numerous small bodies out there in the solar system. Um, of course, you have small moons. We talked about the captured asteroids of Mars, which now make up its moons. You have objects in the asteroid belt, in the Kuiper belt, all these small worlds out there. And comets are among them. This comet came from something uh, called the Oort cloud, which is at the farthest reaches of our solar system. And out there, most of the objects are going to be made up of ice, water ice and dry ice. So what I'd like us to do now is we're going to make a comet. 
Let's see, these ones will work. Oh. <laughs> so let's do our best to make a comment here. I've got my recipe. Oh, two recipes. And we're going to make it in this bowl. And I'll mention each of the ingredients I put in. I'll show them to you. The camera view, Drew, is it good? Yep. All right. OK. So let's see what we got in our box. So I've got some gravel and dust. So it does have some more rocky material in it. Not a lot, but you can see as I dump it in, just some gravel. and some dust. So comets can be dusty. OK. And then, well, we, we covered the rock. So we got some gravel. We got some rock in there. Then we have some iron. Let's see if we still have enough iron in here. Yes, we do. So some iron. That's Fe on the periodic table. I'm just going to pour a bit of metallic iron in here. So uh, asteroids, for example, they ha often have a lot of iron um, in them, as long as it's a ferrous uh, meteor or asteroid. So uh, comets do have some traces of iron. So that's why we put that in. And then we have nitrogen. Nitrogen. Nitrogen's in the room right now. Most of our atmosphere is composed of nitrogen. So we can take some of that and put it in, but also we're going to use some ammonia, which is NH3, is the chemical composition of ammonia. One part nitrogen, three parts hydrogen. So we got our nitrogen. Uh, now we need some, let's use these. We need some hydrocarbons. OK, so sugar is a hydrocarbon. These are the kinds of organic molecules that you'd find. And this is what we're made up of. Um, organic compounds are things made up of carbon. We're made up of a lot of carbon. So we got to put some hydrocarbons in here, which we'll use nerds in this case. That's our sugar hydrocarbon. So comets and meteors that were full of these hydrocarbons help seed the Earth, in this case, uh, with the foundations for life. And then we've got to add our dry ice. That comes next. OK, and I'll, i got to wear a glove for this. Dry ice is very cold, much colder than your regular water ice. And again, dry ice is carbon dioxide. It's the gas that we breathe out as we respirate. We take in oxygen, we breathe out carbon dioxide. OK, so let's see if I can remove one of the layers here. OK, we already got a good snowball going on in there. So let's see if we can dump some of it out into our comet generator. Can you see all of that smoke come off? Now, it's not really smoke. It's also not carbon dioxide. It's the water in the room that's uh, rapidly condensing. It's basically a cloud. Our clouds are made of water. So that's what we're seeing there as we get the dry ice out. But here's what dry ice looks like. Looks like snow, right? But it's a, where snow is water, this is carbon dioxide. And again, it's very cold, so I can only hold it with the glove on. All right, so we got our dry ice. And oh, we need some water. There is water ice involved as well. And this is liquid water, but when we get it on the dry ice, it's going to quickly freeze. Because um, dry ice is about negative 110 degrees Fahrenheit. Really cold, right? So we'll add some water to our comet. 
So now I gotta mix all the ingredients up. Okay. Gotta get our all the ingredients mixed together so that we get a nice dirty snowball is basically what it's gonna become. <laughs> It's not going to look too different from all the snow you see on the side of the road <laughs> now that it's not fresh anymore. <laughs> so this is gravity at work as we condense our comet down. All right, let's see if we crunched it enough to get a solid object. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Yeah, not too bad. So there is our comet. Like I said, a dirty sm snowball with some nerds in it. <laughs> so, as I come around the room, as I move it, see how that carbon dioxide comes off of it? Kind of making a tail. So if you've seen some pictures, which I will show you some in a moment, of the comet, comets have tails. In fact, they have two tails. So uh, but you need some energy to get a good tail going. And that energy comes from the sun. So when the sun is facing this way, I'm just going to breathe on the comet so we can make a tail. So it's all that energy coming off of the sun that produces that. All right. So I'll come down the aisle here and just show you the comet. Our dirty snowball. Carbon dioxide, nitrogen, water, hydrocarbons. You got your water ice in there as well. <laughs> Cookies and cream, right? <laughs> All right. Let's see if I can kind of be able to leave it on the bag just for a little bit. It's not the CO2 I'm worried about. I'm more worried about the water melting all over the place. <laughs> all right. So there's our comet. We'll see how it behaves as the last few minutes go on here. All right. OK. So that's what a comet is. It's a big, dirty snowball in space. And this is Comet ZTF, or the Green Comet. Like I said, it's got a 50,000 year orbital period. It comes from the Oort cloud. These, co these comets that take a long time to come back around, they're ultimately from the Oort cloud deep in the solar system. This is where you start to enter an area of interstellar space, where you'll get a mixing of objects from other solar systems. You'll have some from ours. You'll have some from someone else's. <laughs> so uh, what's interesting about this is that while the current projections say that this comet has been in our solar system for some time, meaning it 50,000 years ago it came by uh, the sun, right now they think that this comet is now on a trajectory after passing by Jupiter and Jupiter's gravity disturbing its orbit. They now think it's on a path out of the solar system. So this one might never come back. Not that we'd be around to figure that out, but um, for sure. But <laughs> this one might not ever come back. And uh, it, that means it will become an interstellar comet. It'll start traveling to solar systems beyond the sun. All right, so the current magnitude right now is around five to six. The, uh, I was seeing varying figures. I think uh, 5.4 uh, was the one I saw the most of. So remember I said six or seven is when you can't really see it in the sky? This is going to be right on the cusp. In nice dark skies, you can find this comet with your eye. Now, it's not going to be very bright. To your eye, it's just going to be a smudge. But when you use cameras, you get some really nice detail out of it where you get the two tails, the dust tail here, and the ion tail there. 
And there's that green color as well. By the way, that green color on a comet comes from carbon. Not just your ordinary carbon, though. It's gaseous carbon. And more than that, it's two carbon atoms paired to each other. We call it diatomic carbon. So uh, when that type of carbon turns into a gas, like it is around the comet itself, we call that the coma. When the sun's energy and the, uh, the light of the sun hits the comet, it energizes that carbon, and the carbon emits a green color. Okay, so that's what we're seeing that green color come from. Now here's another picture that happened around January 17th. Actually, it's an animation. Um, this is co Comet ZTF, and this is the ion tail uh, during a disconnection event, or at least the remnants of one. So the ion tail is a bunch of charged particles, uh, carbon, uh, ionized carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide. And again, that tail glows, similar to the coma. The sun's light is, and the, the uh, solar winds are hitting the comet in such a way to energize those ions, and those ions will emit light. So the comet is emitting its own sources of light through that ion tail. And up towards the top again, you can just about see the dust tail as well. Again, the dust tail is going to be uh, exactly what it sounds like, kind of like that carbon dioxide flowing off of the comet itself. Uh, so this shows an example of what happens when there's a lot of solar storms going on in our solar system, a lot of solar wind. It can uh, perturb or disturb that ion tail, and you see that happening right here. You see the remnants of that disturbance in the tail. Usually it'd just be a steady stream, but you got this big clump going on there. And that came from solar storms. OK, so let's see. Now today's APOD. APOD stands for Astronomy Picture of the Day. And this is today's. It's about the comet. So um, by the way, it's great if you could, NASA uh, operates this. Um, the astronomy picture of the day. So you can even just download their app, and they have a great widget that will sh it'll pop up on your phone every day, showing you what they what astro image they have to show you. Um, this was an image from January 23rd, though. <laughs> Actually, from the same person that uh, from the per the first image I showed you, but it's more recent. And I, I have th the question here says, how many tails do comets have? Well, I told you earlier it was two. How many tails do you see here? Three. three. Very, yep, you'll, you see three. OK, that's weird. Um, you have these two. The fanned out tail is the dust tail. This stream here is the ion tail. Actually, I should show. I should use the mouse, shouldn't I? This stream here is the ion tail, and this is the fanned out dust tail. This is what we call an anti-tail. Uh, and basically what that is, it's all the particles being left behind by the comet as it ventures out of the solar system now. So it's already got to its closest point to the sun, and now it's flying outwards, and it's leaving behind this trail. So that is the anti-tail. And uh, I want to show you the perspective here on this comet. Here's a little look at its orbital path through the solar system. Okay, So here's where the comet is right now with respect to the sun and the Earth. That's the comet. So it's kind of a neat perspective. We're almost right in the plane of the comet's orbit. which And it's almost like it's right above us. So when we look at it, the comet from below, that's what gives us the opportunity to see those three tails um, and the ion tail and dust tail overlaid on top of each other. Whereas when you're looking at it more from the side, you're going to see them, the dust tail and the ion tail separate. We have some great images of comets in the computer lab. Comet uh, Halebop shows you an example of that dust tail and ion tail separate from each other. In this case, it just happens to look like they're right on top. So kind of a, a neat view there that shows you where this comet is and why we get that image we saw here. 
And again, notice that green color coming from all that gaseous carbon. Now, the comet is an option to find in Stellarium. Now, let's see if we can grab it here. Oops, wrong thing. I got to return to current time. Let's see where it is. C 2022 E3ZTF. There we go. So you'll notice the comet. We can zoom in. It'll give you a, not an exact perfect view of how it would look, but it, they just simulate a comet here. But it does show you where it is in the sky. It's right near the Little Dipper, or Ursa Minor. See here? So right to the uh, sort of east of the, the, the cup of the Little Dipper, right in between Ursa Major and Ursa Minor. And what this means is that this comet is circumpolar right now. And it will be circumpolar for uh, uh, some time. Oh, no, that's all right. Um, so this comet is, as it brightens up and gets closer to Earth, and it hasn't, it potentially hasn't even gotten as bright as it will, because the close approach to Earth is February 1st, this comet is going to just circle around this area of the sky, meaning that that for us, that's great because our skies have been pretty terrible. So whenever there's clear skies in the forecast, and you have, as long as you have dark enough skies to work with, go out and look towards the little dipper and the big dipper and see if you can see that smudge. If you got a pair of binoculars, even better. All right. Uh, so that's the comet. Couple more things to show you here. I just want to talk about some deep sky objects you can find. So deep sky objects are objects beyond our solar system, out amongst the stars. And this is the Orion Nebula, a stellar factory where stars are born. So this is actually visible to your eye in dark enough skies. You won't see all these colors. You need a camera for that. To your eye in a telescope, the Orion Nebula would look kind of greenish. Um, but you would see stellar clouds in the stellar nursery, the Orion Nebula, right in the constellation Orion. Then we have the Pleiades, open star cluster. Again, to your eye, this would look like a grouping of stars. Um, in fact, if you've seen a cluster, actually not too far off from Mars, that is the Pleiades. Um, this picture shows you some of the nebulosity around it. This is what happens after a nebula runs out of fuel. So after the Orion Nebula runs out of fuel, you'll just end up with a cluster of stars. Um, this is the next stage of stellar evolution. There are a few more open star clusters. Here's M35. And the M numbers are just a way to catalog these objects. How about a double open star cluster? These are two clusters right close to each other in the sky in the constellation Perseus. And then one more here, I think the last one. Uh, this is a different wavelength of light, but um, this is the Andromeda Galaxy, M31. And uh, this is, yeah, this is the closest galaxy to our own. Um, well, we live inside of our, our, our Milky Way, right? This is the closest galaxy to the Milky Way, and uh, you can see it with your eye. Uh, you can see this sort of cloudy, ghostly object in the sky. And uh, when you use binoculars or a telescope, you might just be able to make out some of the spiral arms inside it. And then go a step further with a camera, you'll be able to pick out detail like you see here. So the Andromeda galaxy, another great one. Now, I'm not going to spend too much more time going through Stellarium. I'm a little bit overboard at this point, but um, I want to mention some additional tools that you can use at home. So again, there's Stellarium, and you can download that at Stellarium.org or visit the App Store for the uh, phone application. But there's other stargazing apps out there as well. These are just a few. Um, Starwalk and Sky Guide, those are pretty similar to each other. Um, you'll find some small differences between them, but in general, 
these are all going to do the same thing. Once you jump up to something like Sky Safari, though, that's going to be the more advanced application. Um, you can even use Sky Safari to operate a telescope if you have the right equipment. Um, so <coughs> Sky Safari is for advanced users. I, it is a paid application. Um, but uh, these are all, all, all great to use. Um, and you, again, a downloadable on iOS or, or Android. But you can also use your smartphone for astrophotography itself. Both of these images were taken with a smartphone. Um, both, by the way, also no telescope involved or binoculars, just the lens of the smartphone's camera. Okay, so smartphones are often coming with telephoto lenses, and I know there are some out there that can do even better than this. Um, this is a 5x telephoto lens on a smartphone to get uh, detail on the moon. You can even see crater Tycho down here, um, just about. And uh, there are some that even have 10x telephoto lenses that can really push the magnification and, and get some nice detail out of it. Uh, so you can get pictures of the moon. You can also get pictures of the stars. Uh, now, this was taken at Copernic during the November lunar eclipse. Can you see the eclipse down here? There's the red moon. And you also see the constellation Orion. So here's Orion's belt. Orion Nebula is just peeking out. And the legs of Orion, the shoulder, this shoulder in Orion is Betelgeuse. And uh, Mars is up here. And I miss, oh, here's Pleiades as well, the, that open star cluster we just saw a picture of. So look how much you can capture. And again, just your phone. So I. Uh, I think it's, it's always worth, worth giving it a shot and seeing what you can capture. If you have a way to mount your phone on a tripod, you're going to always get better results with that. All right, so uh, at this point, that does wrap up um, uh, the primary talk of my presentation. Um, I wish you all clear skies. And did I hear that we have potentially clear skies? Oh, hey, we have clear skies. Hey, perfect timing. So, uh, if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to, to field those. And you can come up and ask if you like. I can also field questions in the chat. But I do want to make sure, while it's clear, that you go out and actually look at something that we talked about tonight. So make sure you get the chance to do that in our observatory. And uh, thanks for tuning in. We do have some questions from the chat. So we, okay. can, but we can ask uh, answer some questions here locally. Yeah. yeah, if there's any questions in, in the audience here. All right, All right. What do we got in the chat. Okay, so we'll go to the chat. Um, one of our viewers. Oh, um, sorry, we do have one one question oh, sorry, about yeah. binocular strength. Um, so, so for the comet or just just in general, pretty. I would start with anything. I mean, obviously the, you know, as you uh, increase the your budget, you'll get something better. It can really push the magnification. But what you know, starting small is also good. Yep. Sorry, I don't know. Yeah, the, nothing. I mean, I don't have any, any specific. Sort of depends on what you want to observe, too. Right. We have a question. Yes. Aurora wants to know how many Earths can fit in Jupiter. How many Earths can fit in Jupiter? Ah, uh, you know, I, I think. The red dot is the size of Earth. Yeah, it's about. Uh, the, the red dot can be about two Earths across. Two? Oh, okay. Yep. So I, if I recall, it's something like 10 Earths across the diameter of Jupiter. So across the, the circle. Apparently, it's three Earths can fit across the uh, diameter of the um, uh, of the eye. Oh, it was one off. Okay. And and thirteen hundred Earths would fit inside Jupiter. In the vault. Oh wow! There you go. <laughs> oh, you were. That's very close. Yeah. Um, and then, can the astronauts on the space station feel it moving if it's going thirty or seventeen thousand miles per hour? Oh, that's a great question. And I. I kind of lied a bit earlier that well, you've never gone that fast. Because we kind of are going that fast right now around the sun and through our galaxy. Um, and just like we don't feel that motion, the, uh, the astronauts on the ISS don't either. It's kind of like when you're coasting along on an airplane or in a car, you're going at the same speed, you don't feel that. It's always the like on a roller coaster, the, as you ramp up in speed, that's what makes you feel that motion. 
All right. Thank you. We have a couple of questions from the uh, from the chat. Okay. Uh, Wagon Loads asks, what magnification do I need to see the ISS solar panels? Full width of my field of view. Oh, oh wow, that's a good question. I know there are some brilliant pictures out there uh, of people who have imaged the ISS you know, across the moon. Um, I saw one that even captured color detail as it transited. That was pretty awesome. Um, but uh, I'm not exactly sure what magnification you'd need for that. Okay. Um, I, w I, w I would recommend checking out some of those pictures that are available online. Um, even going to some Reddit groups like r slash astrophotography, they always list their entire procedure for how they took that photo. That'd be a great resource for you as well. Yep. All right. Wagon Loons also asks, are there enough meteors within the orbit of Mars that if pushed into Mars or onto Mars would make Mars the size of the Earth and give Mars an Earth-like mass and gravity? Oh, interesting. You know, I don't know the, the mass of the asteroid belt offhand. Uh, and obviously, like that, those, that mass wouldn't be able to make it to Mars in any conceivable way. Um, the solar system is pretty stable. Um, but just as in a theoretical sense, I'd, I'd be interested to see if you took that mass in the asteroid belt and added it to Mars, would it reach the size of the Earth? A lot of those objects in the asteroid belt are pretty small, but yeah, it's a possibility. All right, and then finally, uh, Linda asks, so the dust tail and ion tail are ahead of the comet in the direction of the, the, the comet is moving? Oh, I missed that one. Uh, I, I meant to explain the directions before. I kind of got to it when I was uh, breathing on our comet, um, and we got to see that, that dust tail blow off um, the, the source. But uh, yes, w the ion tail will always be directly opposite to the sun. Because if you think about solar wind, right, pushing off the sun and moving towards the comet, it's going to blow material off the comet um, and blow that ion tail in the exact opposite direction. The dust tail, um, the, the physics of that are a little more complex. Um, so it's not going to be direct opposite. It is going to be at an angle. And uh, we saw that in one of the pictures where the ion tail, the first picture that I showed you of ZTF, the, the ion tail and the dust tail were separate. The reason they were right on top of each other in the second uh, image was because of our perspective in the solar system rel relative to the comet itself. But yes, they, they will be separated. The ion tail will always be direct opposite from the sun. All right, well, very good. That, uh, that is the uh, extent of our online chat. Jeremy, as always, thank you very much. Oh. And uh, let's go outside and do some observing. Absolutely, and yep. And the don't the worry, those on the YouTube stream, we have not forgot about you. We are just fighting clouds like crazy this, this winter. The, the, they just seem to be stuck above us at all times. So uh, we will do our best to try and capture this comet coming soon here. And uh, we, we look forward to future li uh, observing live streams with you as well. So stay tuned to those and any Friday Night Lives that come up in Winter Star Party too. Yeah, so our next, our next planned uh, live stream will be on February 18th. This is a Saturday night, which is our Winter Star Party have uh, two great uh, uh, speakers, uh, again, this uh, professor from Penn State, uh, astronomy professor, who actually turns out to be Polish and uh, knows a little bit about Copernic himself. And then also uh, we have a, a sort of a, somebody who grew up here locally in the southern tier, is now works at NASA as an engineer and is working on the Gateway and Artemis pro uh, missions. So he'll give us an update on that. So uh, uh, tune back in on February, uh, February 18th for uh, our Winter Star Party. Thanks again. It's great, uh, great to be back uh, on the air.